prosperity in all areas of my life. I'd written a list a few months before of my ideal day. It had things like meditate, exercise, swim in my pool, study personal growth by listening to inspiring tapes and reading books, helping others to achieve everything they can, learn to public speak, spend time outdoors, and after reading through my list, I said to a friend, if I do all these things in a day, I'll never have the time to work. Personal development had been a real passion of mine for the previous seven years, and I really wanted to see you when you were touring, but simply could not justify spending the money on a ticket when I had so many other debts. I was extremely fortunate to be chosen to staff the event and was very grateful that I got to watch almost the entire seminar. When you spoke about your new CD, Meditations for Manifesting, I rushed out to get it at the break, but you had already sold out. That's okay. Patience was one thing I really needed to learn. <laughs> Within a few days, I'd managed to buy one and immediately began using it morning and night. I followed your instructions to the letter. I look back even now and cannot believe how quickly opportunities magically appeared in my life. Within weeks, I stumbled across an ad for an international personal development company that was looking for self-motivated people with a strong work ethic. That's me. Roughly 18 months later, my life reads straight off of my ideal day list. I now work from home and have an international business marketing self-empowerment courses and seminars. I only work when I want to, so I get to enjoy my two beautiful children and the Sunshine Coast where we live. I have the time to swim and walk along the beach every day. I earn a six-figure income working part-time. That in itself is a miracle. I've been able to take my children to Bali for the school holidays and recently spent a month in Hawaii learning, relaxing, and swimming with the dolphins. I get to talk with people on a daily basis, helping them to achieve their dreams. I've even had the opportunity to speak in front of hundreds of people to inspire and motivate them to transform their lives. My business is the personal development industry. So as part of that, I do meditate and read and listen to tapes daily. It is now my work. All I can say is, wow, I manifested into my life a miracle. I have achieved a wonderful balance in my body, mind, and spirit and experienced financial abundance as well. Two years ago, I was on the sole parent's pension, alternating between crying and feeling so sorry for myself and screaming like a madwoman at my children, feeling as though I had no control over any aspect of my life. And that all changed in a heartbeat. Now I'm living a lifestyle I once only dreamed of. I understand that I am the co-creator of my life and feel grateful and blessed I have made that discovery. And I want to thank you so much for your wonderful CD that helped change the direction of my life. Sandy Forster. Now, that letter is one of hundreds of letters that I have received over the years since I began teaching meditations for manifesting, japa, which is a way to use a mantra, first out loud and then quietly, and to practice it as a ritual of your life every day, and put your attention or your energy on what it is that you intend to create and manifest with passion, and then to surrender and let go. And if nothing else, Japa teaches us the exquisite nourishment of the soul that you experience when you begin to repeat the sound that is the opening line of the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That sound, as a mantra, repeated as I have taught on that meditation CD. And today, I think we have um, sold close to a half a million of those CDs and have perhaps a million or so people doing japa all around the planet. Sri Guruji said that when we get 1% of our population doing japa every day, it will be enough to initiate a consciousness shift. But earlier I also talked about something in silence. And I called it the gap. And I spoke in one of the earlier principles about this gap between the world of the physical where problems exist 
and the space called spiritual enlightenment or spiritual energy and how to bridge that gap between these two places. And what I'd like to do right now is to teach you here in this room and those of you listening a meditation. I'd like to take a few minutes, perhaps ten or so, and show you what it's like to go into the gap. Now, it is said that it is the space between your thoughts. Remember, thought is an energy. And that every thought can be calibrated as an energy, as you'll see when I speak about this in the 10th uh, principle here. And that while a thought has an energy, and the next thought has an energy, it is out of the space between the thought that the next thought needs to emerge. It's said that it's the silence between the notes that makes the music. So that if you just had one note, uh, that is just an uninterrupted noise. You can never have music. In order to have music, you have to have spaces between the sounds. And all of a sudden, you've now got the potential for music. So it's the space between the notes that makes the music. And it's the space between the thoughts that allows us to create. It's the source of everything. So this gap between our thoughts is a very important concept. It is said that the average person has something like 60,000 thoughts every day. The only problem is they have the same 60 thoughts today that they had yesterday, and they're going to have the same 60 thoughts again tomorrow, and we have this constant state of chatter going on in our heads, which is nothing more than the repetition of the same thoughts over and over and over again. And I've used the metaphor before of a pond, and on the surface of the pond is where all of the disturbances are. And on the surface of the pond, we have the freezing and the thawing. And on the surface of the pond, we have the collection of all of the debris and all of the dirt and so on. And all of the storms of our pond are on the surface. But if you go just below the surface, you have fewer disturbances. And if you get way down, way below the surface, you have the serenity, you have the peace. And it's the same that's true of your mind. On the surface of your mind, is where all of the disturbances are. This is what we call chatter. And there's this constant 60,000 thoughts a day. I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. Oop, I want to get there, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. I've got to get the children, and the children have got to be picked up in school. And when I have to pick them up in school, I've got to get some diapers and the diaper rash. And, I've got to, and it's just this endless kind of chatter. So if you have a whole day in which you're conscious for, say, uh, 17 or 18 hours, and you have 60,000 thoughts, you have almost no opportunity to go into the gap, which is the place where all creation takes place, the ability to create the life that you want and the peace that you want. If you can reduce that from 60,000 thoughts to 20,000 thoughts a day by meditating. And I always often say that uh, when people say, I don't have time to meditate, I suggest that every time you stop at a red light, you have an opportunity to meditate. The light will stay red for... Two minutes, in many cases. You go into a deep meditation, as soon as you stop, there's always someone behind you to let you know when your two minutes are up. <laughs> you don't have to worry about overstepping your bounds. And if you stop at uh, 20 red lights a day, you know, you've got yourself 40 minutes or so of, of meditation time. You can do it at any moment that you want. You can take the opportunity to do this. But understanding this concept of the gap, remember, it is out of the silence. When I talked to a composer of music, and he said, the silence that the note comes from is just as important a part of the music as is the note itself. That you have to be able to go to that place. And it's so it is true with whatever it is you want to create in your own life. It is out of the void. So the gap is not just a fun thing to talk about. It is, it is a way of reducing the amount of chatter 
on the surface of your mind and going down to the depths where you'll come to make conscious contact with God, that which is indivisible. You can't divide the silence. So I'd like to take a prayer, a prayer that most people in the Western world know about. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And I'd like to take the first uh, few words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Ten words or so. And I'd like to have you in your mind put your attention on the word that I speak. And then I'd like to take a moment to go to the next word. And I'll direct you as when to do this. And then I would like to have you slip back into the gap between the two words. And just notice how you feel when you're in the gap and try to stay there for 10 or 15 seconds. And then we'll go to the next word. And we'll do this for a few moments. And then we'll conclude. Okay? So if you will just close your eyes and put your attention on the word our, O-U-R, our, our, now put your attention on the word Father, Father. And now slip back into the space between those two words, right? Now. And stay as long as you can with your thought on nothing more than the space between. Now I'd like you to shift your attention to the word Father. See the word Father. And now shift to the word, which. And now slip back into the gap between those two words and just notice the gap. And now move to your attention to the word, which. W-H-I-C-H. And now to the word, art. A-R-T. And now quickly back into the gap and notice the feeling now. And now go to the word art. See the word. And now go to the word in. And now slip back into the gap for 15 seconds. Now. Now see the word in, in your consciousness. And now get a picture of the word heaven. And now quickly back to the gap between them, between in and heaven. Go into there now. Now go to the word heaven. Now see the word hallowed, hallowed. And now when you go into the gap this time, notice how you feel while you're in the gap. And any thought that comes to you other than the thought of the gap, push it out. Thank it for being there and dismiss it. Heaven, hallowed, into the gap. to the word hallowed and now to the word be be and now 
into the gap and dismiss any thoughts other than just the gap, the space. Hallowed be the gap. And now I'll go to the word be, be, see a picture of that word. And now shift forward to the word thy, be and thy. Now quickly back into the gap and notice how you feel. And now go to the word thy. And go forward to the word name. Now back into the gap when I say so, and only experience the gap. Let go of all thoughts as being important or yours, and just be in the gap between thy and name now. Okay, stay in that space. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And what is thy name? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the name was God. Together, everyone. God again God again Just say, God, let your arms just go up to the sides and rise as they will. God. Notice they're like feathers. So that is a way of just experiencing in a very brief way a means for understanding what the gap is like. It is the silence between the notes that makes the music. It's the space between your thoughts that creates everything. And out of the void, we create the peace that is known as God. Let's take a few moments, uh, maybe some of your reactions, thoughts quickly. I want to give uh, the mic, I want to pass the mic around so I can hear your comments. Go ahead. Uh, yes, well, I certainly could feel the gap very succinctly, and uh, which is interesting, uh, which leads me to a question I have. I practice primarily sound meditation, right, Dr. Chopra, and of course we talk about going into the gap. Um, so I've done that. Now, how does that, how would you relate that to the Jopra, which is, the sound of God and the sound of Om. I did both for a while. Then you know, it, I, how would you compare one to the other? Or I never compare. There's no such thing as a bad meditation, and whatever it is that brings you the peace, the peace of God, and allows you to get into that gap, I encourage you to use. Um, 
Japa for me starts out with sound because it's an access and it's a way of manifesting. The letter from Sandy Forrester is really a letter that suggests that if you put your attention on what it is, what you intend to manifest and create in your life, that you have the power to negotiate the presence of this into your life, not because you're becoming more powerful, but because you are now making conscious contact with God. And whatever it is that allows you to do that... Um, Japa is a meditation that goes back thousands and thousands of years and one that resonates with me. And the less sound that we use, the more it becomes a mantra internally. It just allows us to stay in the gap easier. My father got hospitalized in December and in one of those nights that I stayed with him, in this silence a poem came to my mind which I would like to share with you. Father, in the glue of the morning, when daylight starts, the message of morning reached our hearts. The moment of sorrow, the moment of pain, will there be tomorrow? Love will remain. A father forever embedded in light. Eternity rests in the darkness of the night. I listen to your voice, speechless thoughts, they flow, silence puts down all the noise, tomorrow will come, I know. Where are you after you left being here? Do you see? Do you feel? Are you near? Close to what we are, you will light a star. I read this to him the next morning when he was awake, and he said, this is beautiful. You need to copy it. So I'd like to copy it to you. That's very nice, very nice. I love that. Any others, any other thoughts, comments, Ricardo? Yes, uh, when we were doing that um, meditation, I felt credible peace. Credible peace. Thank you. Any other reactions, especially about getting into that gap? The first couple of times, I felt like I was falling backwards. And then I felt really light and like, you know, sort of not like anything I could really describe, but, you know. It, it moved from that sort of backwards falling to something that I can't really describe. Thanks. Um, during the gap, as usual, I felt I was testing myself. But when the voice came, I didn't recognize it. It was like some Buddhist voice from somewhere else. It was very strange. It was the first time that I was ever able to totally silence my mind and hear nothing but silence. One of the best techniques that I've ever discovered for myself on how to do exactly what you're speaking about, to get past those thoughts that... Let me re-read to you what Hawkins said about the mind. The letting go of thinkingness is facilitated by the awareness from the spiritual viewpoint that all thoughts are vanities with no intrinsic reality or value. Their attraction stems from the exaggerated value that accrues from their being considered as mine, these thoughts, and therefore special and worthy of respect and admiration or even careful preservation. He says, to undo the grip of the mind requires a radical humility and an intense willingness to surrender its underlying motivations. This willingness receives energy and power from the willingness that arises from the love of God and the passion for surrendering love of thought for love of God. You are surrendering love of thought for love of God. And then the gap, that feeling that you have, did any of you experience a little thing in your brain that just was like a little, just a little spark of, uh, of pleasure, like, oh, that little, how many have, could have that feeling when you go into that gap? Just for a split second, you go back and, and something goes through you, like through your brain, up through your spine, that kundalini. That, that's God. That's when you have no thought 
and you have gone past this idea that your thoughts are so important, and you've surrendered the love of your thoughts for the love of God, and you'll only know that in the gap. Okay, this is the uh, fifth principle. A reminder, it's never crowded along that extra mile. And one of the reasons for that is so many people are consumed by their past and living as if the things that happen to them in their life are the reasons why their life isn't going the way they would like it to go today. I'd like to suggest to you that in this principle, which I call giving up your personal history, I'd like to suggest to you that all of that is uh, wonderful to talk about in therapy, and you can get a lot of help, literally, for uh, going back and examining the things in your past that uh, perhaps are troubling for you. But the illusion is that these are the things or the reasons why your life is not working the way you would like it to work today. That is the illusion. It's the illusion that Alan Watts spoke about when he used the metaphor of the wake of the boat. That the wake of a boat is nothing more than the trail that is left behind. If you stand on the back of a speedboat and watch it, it's a wonderful metaphor. You can get that picture in your head. You can simply see how it is all just a trail that is left behind. And if you ask yourself, what's driving the boat? What's making it go forward? The answer is that what's making it go forward is the present moment energy that is being generated by the engine in this moment, now. And that's the only thing that can make the boat to go forward. And the most important question to ask yourself about this little metaphor is, is it possible for the wake to drive the boat? Can a wake, that is, can a trail that is left behind make a boat go forward? And of course the answer to that is no, and thus it is also true for your life. That the wake of your life is also a trail that is left behind. And this trail that is left behind is just that. It is not what is making you inefficient, poor, unhappy, depressed, stressful, sick, uh, in bad relationships, and so on. Even though we like to think that and we like to put the responsibility for those things on all of these events that took place in our past, the fact is, the way I look at the past, is that everything that happened to us in the past had to happen in order for us to be where we are today. And the evidence that I have for that is that it did. <laughs> and there's nothing else to say about it. It did, and it can't be undone. A thousand years ago, a man named Omar Khayyam, who was a tent maker in the Muslim world, observed the moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on. Nor all thy piety nor wit can lure it back to cancel half a line. Nor all thy tears wash out one word of it. He knew that in the Middle Ages. And yet we've got people who are consumed with the belief that because of the way you treated me, because of what you said to me, because of how I was abandoned, because of how I was mi was, mi was mi because of how I was abused, because of how I was ignored, because of my past, that I lived in uh, this particular set of circumstances or that, that these are the reasons why my life is not going the way I would like it to go today. And if there's any advice that I think will help you to get onto the extra mile where it's not very crowded. It came to me from a man named uh, Carlos Castaneda, who I was reading something that he had written in a book called uh, The Fire From Within. And he said, One day, I finally realized that I no longer needed a personal history. 
He said, and just like drinking, I gave it up. And he said, that and only that has made all the difference in my life. So that all of these things and all of these events that transpired, that took place up until now, all you can do can to them is thank you. And I'm talking about all of it. Thank you for abandoning me. Thank you for the abuse. Thank you for the struggles. Thank you for all of it because it is out of those falls and out of those struggles and all of those difficulties that I generated the energy to propel myself to a higher place. And without those falls, without those struggles, without those difficulties, I wouldn't be able to get to the place I am today. wonderful woman that uh, I have come to respect a great deal and know. Her name is Carolyn Meese. And she has a tape that I heard a few years ago called uh, uh, Why People Don't Heal, I believe it is. And the central theme of her tape, when I heard that tape, I was just fascinated by it. In fact, it was the only time in my entire professional life that I m went out of my way to call somebody who was just beginning on this path, and to offer an endorsement. Now, I get requests for hundreds of endorsements every week for something, most of which I am unable to do. But in this case, I was so taken by the profound wisdom of what and how she presented it that I called and left a message with her that if she would like my endorsement, if she's interested in that, I'd be happy to give it. And she did. And uh, what she said is that the reason that people don't heal in their life is because they are bonded to the wounds of their past. They not only have understood them and practiced them and perhaps even embraced them and understood them, but they have now bonded to them. And they use these wounds as a rationale for why their life isn't working the way they would like it to work today. And they continue... They continually haul out all of these uh, terrible things that happened. And within five minutes of meeting them, you'll know that they're an alcoholic. Or that, they're, uh, that they were sexually abused. Or that um, their father walked out on them. Or that they lived in an orphanage. Or that they were very poor. Or that they... Uh, had uh, they suffer from depression or whatever it might be. And the constant using of these wounds of the past as almost like a calling card is what keeps them back there. When I suggest to you that you don't have to have a personal history, I'm not saying that you have to give up everything and everyone that ever happened to you and you have to forget about it and not have traditions. I'm suggesting that you take this very, very seriously, that the reason why your life is going the way it is going is because of the choices that you are making today, right now, in your life. And that anything else that you are using that is back here in the wake 
as a rationale or an explanation for your, why your life isn't going the way you would like it to go is nothing more than an excuse to which you will bond yourself, and a res, as a result of that bonding, you will keep yourself back living in those obstacles rather than creating an intention of what you want to have for yourself in your life. And it's a very common thing to do. And on the extra mile, you'll find people. I remember Castaneda's teacher telling him, um, you'll know when you are free from your personal history. Because he said, look, he said, if you don't have a story, you don't have to live up to it. Which is pretty good. <laughs> you just don't have to live up to your story. He said, the way that you will know that you are free from this is that you should check yourself into the seediest motel that you can possibly find with cockroaches in it and with the paint that is, uh, uh, you know, chipped off the walls and uh, the most unpleasant kind of place that you can check yourself into and don't tell anyone that you're there and you stay in that room and don't come out until it makes no difference to anyone whether you do or you don't. How's that for a test? Until you get free from this idea of what somebody else might think or what's, what might say or might begin to use on you. And most of this stuff that is in our past is all related to our family. My mother, my father, my siblings, my in-laws, whatever. There's a wonderful line that I really love. And in fact, I've been thinking about writing a book with this as the title. Your friends are God's way of apologizing for your relatives. <laughs> what do you think? Is that a good title? <laughs> And I've suggest that uh, you look at uh, all of the things that you have allowed in your past to be the reasons why, particularly in your, in your relationships with your family, and just say to yourself, I no longer have a personal history. You know, I am not attached to any of that at all. I look upon my personal history, and I have for a long time, uh, as one of the great advantages of my life. Because I feel that when we come here, we have a heroic mission, and that it was my dharma, my destiny, my path, if you will, to, uh, to teach self-reliance. I've never done anything else since I was a little boy. And my entire professional life and all of my teaching and uh, all of the work that I've done, all of the books have all been directed towards just teaching people about self-reliance. And it's almost as if God said... If you really want to teach self-reliance, then you'll have to get your little ass into an orphanage <laughs> and spend a few years there learning to rely upon yourself. And once you learn how to do that, once you have that experience of how to do that, then you'll never use it as an excuse or a rationale or a reason why you can't, um, you can't get something done yourself. You don't have to blame anybody else. You'll know to rely upon yourself, and it won't be because of something that uh, you learned in a book or that you heard on a tape. It'll be because you have made conscious contact with self-reliance. And you had to have it, and you had to do it. And the people that I have had the greatest amount of respect and admiration for over the years are the people who have been through it understood it, written about it, or told other people about it, and let it go, and moved on in their life. And if you can't do that, if you're still wallowing around back there in your personal history, well, I like to make a distinction between uh, the things in our lives that we call struggles or difficulties, we we'll just call them struggles, and facts. Our struggles and facts, the facts of life. Now, the fact is that I am six foot one. The fact is that I am 61 years of age. Fact is that I weigh 185 pounds. Fact is 
all of the things that are unchangeable about my life are facts. Fact is that my hairline has receded slightly since I was a little boy, <laughs> all the way to the back of my neck. <laughs> These are the facts. Now, if any one of you were to tell me tomorrow, I would like you to come to this lecture hall, and I would like you to be five foot four, and I'd like you to be thirty years of age, and I'd like you to have a full head of hair, please. All right. You would say, "Well, you can't do that because the facts are such, and you can't do anything about the facts." Most of you would agree that you can't be a different age or different height, um, a different sex, and so on than you are right now. Is that correct? These are the facts of your life, and there's lots of those facts, lots of them. How much is in your bank book? Uh, what kind of work you do? What kind of education you've had in your life, and so on. These are all facts. Now, the problems or the struggles that you face in your life are something very different. These are the result of how you interpret things and so on. You understand that you can do something about the struggles and about the problems and about the, the things that you face in your life. That you can do something about. You can change the way you think, the way you process things. You can move. You can change relationships. There's a lot of things that you can do. You can uh, go back to school. You can learn a new trade. There's endless numbers of things you can do about the problems, the struggles that you face in your life. We can do lots of things about that. But you can't do anything about the facts. The real facts, and there aren't too many, but the biggest fact of your life that you can do absolutely nothing about is your past. And most people spend about eighty percent of their mental energy on trying to change or being upset about the facts. And that's what I'd like you to take a look at when I say. Give up your personal history. It's a fact. You had these parents. <laughs> I've often told the story of my daughter Serena, who uh, I have had a few um, interchanges with over the years. <laughs> <laughs> She's always been the one who has been uh, very willing to uh, let me know when I'm not doing things the way she thinks that I should do them. And I remember one day finally just reaching the end of the line with her, and saying something out loud like, "You know, I'm really tired of you telling me what kind of a parent I should be and what I'm doing wrong." Because she was really good at that. And uh, and instead, what I'd like to do is have you start taking responsibility for the kind of parent I've become. <laughs> She said, "You you want to run that one by me one more time? You want me to be responsible for the kind of parent?" I said, yeah, "Absolutely." I said, "I am who I am. These are the facts of who I am and what I've been, and I can't change them. These are the facts. And the fact is that you chose me to be your father. And if you didn't want me to be your father, you should have chosen someone else." I got her attention. She was about eleven. She said, "Hold it," and she did it just like that. Hold it, there. Hold it. You're telling me that I chose you. I, I don't. I don't know what you're talking about. I said, "Well," I said, "Before you came into this world, I said you have certain things that you have to accomplish here on this planet, and all of us have certain things that we have to do, and we need parents in order to get through." So you decided that mom would be your mother and that I would be your father. She said, "I don't have any memory of any of this <laughs> at all." I said, "Well, your memory is not a good indicator of whether what I'm saying is true or not. Of course, you don't have any memory of it. You don't even remember be- living in a crib. You don't remember what you had for breakfast last Thursday. You don't remember uh, being in mom's tummy. You don't remember being born. You don't. Be- but there's most of the things of your life you have no memory of. Your memory is not a good indicator. We can't use your memory." I said, "You got to trust me on this. You chose me to be your father. You chose mom to be your mother." 
She said, well, when do you think this took place? She got really intrigued by this. I said, well, it took place before you decided to come here. She said, so you're telling me that I actually picked you to be my father. I said, exactly. And she gave me the greatest line. She said, I must have been in a hurry. <laughs> you could never go one up on Serena. All right? <laughs> I was just sort of semi-kidding with her, but, uh, but there is a part of me that really believes that uh, we did have to pick certain people. I mean, the most influential person in my life, probably the person who turned my life from a, a life that was headed towards uh, uh, anonymity, a life that was... Uh, I was overweight, I was drinking, I was uh, playing around with drugs, I was, um, my writing was going nowhere, I wanted to write, but I just couldn't, I was in relationships that just didn't match and didn't work out, I was, um, I was always trying to get someplace else, um, I, I ate horrible, horrible, greasy, what I call greasy cheeseburgers, three of them with shiny buns, I always remember, <laughs> I always remember the term shiny buns because if the grease wasn't on the buns enough and they weren't shiny enough, I'd send them back. I mean, I'd, I would eating that kind of stuff and drinking uh, soda pop and uh, drinking uh, alcohol. And, and uh, so many things in my life were, uh, were headed down a, a, a path that was not going to uh, materialize into the, into the destiny, the heroic mission that all of us have and that I showed up here for. And this man that... Uh, was the most influential person in my life, was a man that I grew up hating, that I never saw in my life, who walked out on my life when I was just a child, never even, when I was just an infant, never made a phone call, never, never even acknowledged that he had a son named Wayne. This was my father. And it wasn't until much, much later in my life, when I was in my 30s, just before I wrote Your Erroneous Sounds, that I was able to go to his grave and... Uh, and have an act of forgiveness. And when I had that act of forgiveness and, and I let go of all of this stuff that I had just carried around with me for so many years, I walked away from it. I sent away the anger and the hatred and the bitterness. And, and I started sending this person love who was now dead. And I walked away from that experience. I've written about it. I've talked about it on other tapes. I've wrote about it and you'll see it when you believe it. Um, but I walked away from that experience in 1974, and I went, and I checked into a motel, a seedy one, <laughs> with cockroaches, <laughs> in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I wrote a book called Your Erroneous Zones in uh, 14 days, beginning to end. And it became the catalyst, the turning point in my life. I began to give up... Um, the uh, sedentary lifestyle, the couch potato lifestyle. I began running and becoming active. I began to attract into my life more uh, profound uh, ideas and people in my life. Uh, everything just seemed to turn around because I, I gave up my personal history. I gave up the idea that I was feeling sorry for myself for being an orphan or for living in foster homes or for not having a father. I gave it all up and realized that that was a choice that I made, perhaps unconsciously, perhaps even before I ever showed up. Who knows? But who's to question it? How can you question the facts? I don't go around and say, you know, I was born in 1940. I should have been born in 1460. I mean, you don't go around saying that. You say, I, that's the fact of my life. I showed up on the 10th of May in 1940. That's the day I showed up. And I was conceived sometime in September of 1939. That's a fact. And you don't change the facts. And by giving up our personal history, what we do is we give up our, our attachment to, to the past and our bonding to our wounds. And we merge into something much more powerful, into this thing called the now. And the now is easy to talk about but difficult for most people to be in and yet it's the only place you can ever be. Every moment that you have of guilt in your life, 
about what could have happened, what should have happened, takes place in the now. So people have often said, well, guilt is just a way of living in the past. There is no possibility of living in the past. It's an illusion of the ego. You can't live in the past. What you do is you use up your present, being immobilized over what took place in the past. But you're always in the present. And that's the only place that God is. Here, in this moment. And you don't worry by living in the future. There's nobody out there living in the future. You're living now, in the present, using up your moments now to be immobilized over what might or might not happen down the road. But make no mistake about it, that's all taking place now. This is all you get. Just the now. And to use up your now with this personal history, one of the great glories of giving up your personal history is you give up guilt along the way. You just give it up. And you start to look at all of these people that were in your life who did all of these things that you think they shouldn't have done. And instead of being mad at them and angry at them and using up your now with that anger and with that hatred and that bitterness... You begin to practice letting it all go. It's about, it's about understanding that people come into the world and do what they know how to do. Giving, given the circumstances of their life, they do what they know how to do. It isn't good or bad. It isn't right or wrong. It isn't moral or immoral. It's just they're doing what they knew how to do. When I went down to Biloxi to, to go to my father's grave in 1974, the only thing I wanted to know on that trip was if he ever in his life acknowledged that he had a son named Wayne. It was my ego at work. I just wanted to know, did this man ever acknowledge myself and my two brothers? And I found the death certificate. And it was in Biloxi, Mississippi. And it was kept in an old Coca-Cola box with uh, rain spots on the box. And uh, we finally went through to his death was 1964 in New Orleans and when they shipped his body there and all of that. And I pulled out the file and I went through it and went through it and I finally found the day that he had died. They had it done by date, not even by name or by person. And uh, I was going through this old file box. It's a cardboard box that uh, Coca-Cola bottles had been shipped in. And I found Melvin Lyle Dyer, and I found his birth date and his death date, and I looked on down the list to see if he had any um, descendants. Yeah, and there were my three brothers' names: Jim, David, and Wayne. And I was like at peace. I thought, you know, this guy came into the world. And he basically knew that he was a jerk. And he not only did to what he did to my mother, but he did it to five additional women and uh, abandoned everybody and spent years of his life in prison and was an alcoholic and uh, abusive person. And everybody, I used to think it was just my mother. I used to say, my mother, I said, there's, you know, there's a good side to everybody. Yeah, and she'd say, yeah, you try being married to him. You go find someone that has something good to say about him. And I met each one, I researched his life and met each one of his ex-wives. And all of them basically had the same opinion uh, <laughs> that my mother had had. And I thought to myself, he must have known at some level that his presence in my life would drag it down and in my brother's life. Somehow, by being there, perhaps he knew that. And maybe that's why. Maybe... Maybe in my own heart I needed to see something positive or something good about this person. And that's how I've always thought of him, as a person who was, who was noble. And that he stayed away and allowed his ex-wife and his three children at least the opportunity to stay in a different energy field than the one that would have dragged us down. And that's how I see it. And I know the day that I die and when I do come into contact with him that I will share that. And I've shared it with him on many occasions in my own quiet, contemplative, private moments. Because finally, after a lifetime of anger and a lifetime of bitterness, 
I was able to give up my personal history. And I encourage every single one of you to do the same. Don't bond to your wounds. Don't see yourself as all of those labels. Kierkegaard, the famous Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard, once said that once you label me, you negate me. And our past is filled with labels about what we can and can't do. I'm not very good at this. I'm not athletic. I'm not musical. I'm not able to uh, do certain kinds of activities. I don't have a good memory. I'm not very good at mathematics. I've never been good at relating to other people. I'm shy. I'm nervous. I'm clumsy. These are all labels from the wake, from our past. And all of them are just things that you have used as an explanation or as an excuse for why you don't move into a different place in your life. And they all revolve around this thing called failure. I tried them. I wasn't good at them. Therefore, I failed. And when you give up your personal history, you give up the concept of failure. It is, again, another illusion. You have never failed at anything in your life. Everything you've ever done has produced a result. You are just out there producing results. The issue isn't whether you fail. The issue is, what do I do and what have I done with the results that I have produced? So that if you go to, I love that story that I heard not too long ago of a little boy who was walking, and you know how little boys do it? I used to do it all the time, and you take a, you take a softball and you throw it up into the air, and then you have a bat, which is often a stick, it was for us, and you swing at it like this, and you, the little boy throws the ball up into the air, and he swings, and he misses. So he picks the ball up again. And he walks a little further and nobody's around and he throws the ball up into the air and he swings again and the ball falls to the ground. He misses. Then he picks up the ball again and he looks around and nobody's there and he throws it up into the air and he swings his stick. It misses again and hits the floor, the ground. And he responds, what a pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> It's the idea that you can never fail at anything. And I've told, I can't tell you how many endless clients that I have told, you have never failed at anything in your life. If you weigh 300 pounds, and you've weighed 300 pounds for the last 20 years, you have just produced enormous results. <laughs> and the question isn't, why am I such a failure? Why have I always been obese? Why have I always been these terrible things that are back there in the past that I'm bonded to and now coming up with reasons to explain it away? Well, my mother, you know, we have this and then I'm doing it in response to that and this is because of that. And, uh, and you can come up with an endless number of, uh, of reasons. I was talking about this last night, that my brother and I both lived in the same foster homes in the same orphanage for years. And my one brother is very shy and very reserved and uh, has had a great deal of difficulty. And I've been out there, you know, very public and uh, very outgoing and so on. And both of us can explain our behavior on the basis of the same experience. Obviously, I have self-confidence because I never had anybody to give me confidence when I was young. And I was always going from place to place, so I had to go within and rely upon myself. And my brother would say, obviously, I don't have any confidence because I didn't have anybody to give me any confidence when I was young. <laughs> there was nobody there, so that's the way my life is. And you can explain anything away. But if you're that 300-pounder... You have produced results. The question is, what are you doing with the results that you've produced? What are you going to do about that? Are you going to be a great pitcher? And remind yourself of this is a different way to look at that? Or are you going to tell yourself that my personal history is such that there's nothing I can do about it? If you want to walk the extra mile the path less traveled, give up your personal history. If you don't have a story, 
you won't have to live up to it. And you can live every moment in the only place where you'll ever come to know what it's like to be connected and united with God. It's the only place God ever is or ever has been. Right here. Now. Any other thoughts? Ideas? Yes. One of my favorite sayings is, you can't do anything about the past except learn from it. It's a great observation. And you also want to be careful not to be bonded to it. Don't use your weaknesses, your struggles, your difficulties, the things that happen to you as a calling card. You know, sharing it with everybody else and using it as a way to get sympathy for yourself. If you've been through a divorce, if you've been through, if you're a widow, if you've been through cancer, if you've been, whatever it is, don't use that as a way to get attention for yourself. Because what, what it'll do is it'll keep you bonded back here. And it'll also give you more of an opportunity to repeat and attract the very thing that you're still upset about. This, uh, Next principle, number six, uh, came from a line by uh, Albert Einstein when he was talking to his students about trying to solve mathematical problems and equations. He said, you can't ever solve a problem with the same mind that created it. It's... It's what they call sometimes in management circles uh, thinking outside of the dots or outside of the box. Getting out of your comfort zone. Getting out of um, looking at things the way you've always looked at them. And having a different kind of an awareness. I came across this quote not too long ago. Moving away the clouds does not make the sunshine. It merely reveals what was hidden all along. The sunshine, the sun is always there. And you don't make it shine by just taking things away. There's something inside all of us that is hidden. And it's the ability to, uh, I call it rewriting our agreement with reality. It requires a new kind of awareness, a different, a willingness, if you will, to to see yourself as potentially capable of virtually anything. I've always loved the observation from the New Testament of, of Jesus, that even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. That within each and every one of us, there is this ability to to be healers. There's this ability to be able to manifest and attract anything into our lives that we put our attention on. There's this ability to live at such a high level of consciousness that we can uh, transcend our bodies. And I've always sort of taken that line at face value. That each person particularly as I've looked at my own self, I've I've never looked at the reasons why I couldn't attract something into my life. I've just never been wired together that way. So that by wiring, my wiring, my internal wiring has always been one of uh, whatever it is that I've got in my life as a problem that I have to take responsibility for it, but I also have the capacity to be able to change it. And not only to change around what it is that is not working for me, but also to change around what I have been attracting into my life. I think it begins with this, uh, this whole idea of, uh, of being inspired. I've always liked that word, inspired, inspiration because its origin is in spirit. And then the opposite word is uh, uh, being informed. And so when you're in form, in the physical world, when you're in form, 
you get information. You get lots of information. And this is what we call the information age. Right? So there's no shortage of information. They say that on a, a little chip the size of your thumbnail, we can put the names and addresses of everybody in the United States and Canada on, on a little chip the size of your thumbnail. That's really more information, I think, than we need. <laughs> right? And the ability to have information. We have enough information. I mean, I had somebody come up to me and said, I checked on the Internet and I put your name on there and there were 82,000 references to your name. And I said, and I don't even own a computer. And I never, ever sent any information in any place. And yet someone told me there are 82,000, I don't know where they came up with that number, but 82,000 references and cross-references and this and that and in different languages and around, whatever it might be. Um, and I have no idea. I mean, if they saw me masturbating when I was 14, I don't know if that's on there or not. It probably is now that I've mentioned it. Uh, <laughs> A new update. There's somebody back in the room taking notes here. There's just, uh... So the, the information age is what we are and now. But what we are doing is we are moving from the age of information to the age of inspiration, I believe. And as we move into the age of inspiration, where collectively mankind is beginning to have uh, a collective capacity to be able to think thoughts which empower us rather than which weaken us, which uh, according to Hawkins' research, uh, up until about 1985 or 1986, collectively mankind's collective thoughts uh, always produced uh, that which weakens us. And now, in the last few years, we have moved above the level uh, where man's collective consciousness is uh, at least at a place where collectively we are empowering ourselves rather than uh, using force. And as we move into the world of inspiration, we have to understand what that means. And Patanjali had a wonderful observation. I wrote about it in Wisdom of the Ages. He said, when you are inspired, that is, in spirit, and remember, it is in the world of spirit, it is in the world of thoughts where we change, where we go to the place where we create anything we want for ourselves in our lives. So that remembering here, the theme is that you can't solve any problem that you might have in your life with the same mind that created it. So you're moving into a place now called spirit. That which is seen hath not come from that which doth appear. We're moving into the world of the invisible now. When you are inspired... And think about the moments in your life when you've had the most inspiration, inspirado. You, you lose any touch of fatigue. I have gone and been inspired at moments in my life when uh, I have written for almost 24 straight hours without stopping, without, without eating, without uh, thinking about sleep. I just got into one of those modes, you know, what the, we call a zone sometimes, where... Everything just flowed. When you are in that place, you, you transcend everything. And you don't think about, you don't worry about whether people are going to call you or not call you. You don't worry about your children. You don't worry about being sick. You don't think about the cold that you might have. You don't think about being tired and how much sleep you'll need. When you're inspired, you're in spirit. When you're in spirit, you're connected to your source. And now what you're doing is you're moving out of the mindset of inform or information, which is where all problems occur in the world of the physical, and you're shifting into the world of spirit so that when you move into that, here's how Patanjali put it. When you are, in, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all of your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction, and you find yourself in a new and a great and a wonderful world. And then he said something that I really love and is relevant to what we're speaking about here. He said, dormant forces, that is, forces that you thought were dead, dormant forces that weren't accessible to you, 
dormant forces, faculties, and talents come alive. And you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. And all of that is about something called inspiration, moving into spirit, where there are no problems. You see, there are no problems. There's no death in spirit. As Jung said, the telling question of your life is your relationship to the infinite. And infinity, or that which is, uh, never dies, is a part of the word spiritual, as I define it, in a spiritual solution to every problem. So the infinite becomes your, um, the place where you live, your playground, if you will. And when you are in that infinite place, that place in which it is impossible for problems to occur, you are now looking at problem resolution or struggle resolution with a totally different mindset altogether. What you're looking at is how can I, how can I turn this thing over to something to which I'm always connected, which is greater than I am, but is always connected to me? How can I do that? Some call it turning it over to God. But it's almost as if you say to yourself, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know what I can do with this. I know, I, I know somehow how I'm experiencing it is, uh, is very painful for me. And I know that I am going to take responsibility for owning it, whatever it might be, how I feel about it. Is mine. I own that. But I don't know what to do about it. I'm just at a loss. I'm just, it's so painful. It hurts so much. It's, I can't see any solution. I can't get past it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to first of all say that whatever mind I used to create it, I'm not going to use to continue to try to solve it with. It's like I have a doubles partner, my buddy Lenny Solomon. Uh, for years and years and years. And when we get into a match where we're losing and where we are continuously uh, trying to do the same thing, he will often remind me of uh, my definition of insanity, which is to expect new results with the same behavior. Uh, and he'll say, look, we've got to change. You've got to come to the net, or we've got to go back, or we've got to start lobbing, or we've created a place where we are down... <laughs> And we are, don't have a chance to win if we keep doing this. Often I'll just say, look, they're better than we are. <laughs> Especially you. <laughs> but I don't want to remind him of that. Because it's never me. <laughs> but it's that, it's that reminder that we have now created, it's a problem. It's a minor problem. Obviously it's a tennis match. But it is still, I have, we have created this outcome. We have created this with this mindset, and we're not going to solve it with the same mindset. So we have to change. There are certain animals that Castaneda speaks about in the desert that are called power animals. And they have no natural enemies, these power animals. And the reason that they're power animals is because they never do the same thing twice or the same day. You can never predict what their behavior is going to be. They don't just always, when an eagle is overhead, they don't just run. Uh, sometimes they might stop, they might freeze, sometimes they spit something out, sometimes they, stop, they go very softly. So they are constantly altering what it is so that any predator that they might have can never figure them out. That's what you want to become, a power animal that is not predictable. If anybody tells you how predictable you are, you don't want that to be considered a compliment. Emerson said that a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. You know, that you have to always be consistent. You always, but mom, and my kids always say that to me all the time. Dad, you, yesterday you said I could, and you told Serena that we could, and then you told, and then she said that you could, and you could do that. And I always say, wait a minute. Emerson said a foolish consistency is a hobgoblin and a little mind. I don't want to be thought of as having a little mind. And that's a, a fool. Well, you bought her a car and you bought him a car and at that you bought him a car. I said, isn't that great? Now I don't have to buy you one. <laughs> because you wouldn't want me to be uh, a hobgoblin. You wouldn't want me to be a little mind, would you? They throw my stuff back at me, though, worse than I do on them, I promise you. 
But in, in a sense, what I'm suggesting here is the ability to, uh, to change your mind and to rewrite your agreement with reality. And I'd like to help you to rewrite your agreement with reality here. I'd like to suggest to you that um, there is absolutely nothing that you can conceive of that you can't create for yourself in your life. The problem is whether you can conceive of it or not. That's usually the difficulty. And if you can begin to conceive of yourself as someone who has the capacity to do anything that any human being has ever done, rather than be stuck in what other human beings haven't done. It's called breaking through paradigms. You remember Roger Bannister? You know who Roger Bannister was? First person to run the mile in, in under four minutes. And for centuries, it was considered that it was impossible to run a, a mile under four minutes. Human beings couldn't run that fast. They had done calculations. They had figured it all out. You, and finally, after, I don't remember what year it was, but it was in the 1950s, I believe, uh, this man in England, uh, his doctor, went out there, and he ran a mile in under four minutes. The next week, somebody else did it. The next week after that. And now, there are high school students, high school students who run the mile in under four minutes. And now they're talking about the three-minute mile, which is... Um, I think you'd need a Mercedes <laughs> to get there, but uh, they're talking about it because the world record in the mile is somewhere down around 341 or 342 or something like that. I'm not quite sure what it is. Uh, but it's much, much, much lower than it was uh, a few years back. And it's breaking through those kind of paradigms that we have for ourselves in our own lives as well about what it is that we are capable of. Remember, every limitation that you have ever placed on yourself in your life about what you can or can't accomplish is the source of that being your reality. It's the belief that it's, you're capable or incapable of doing it. And the willingness, the ability to shift out of that and into I I like the word intention. I intend to manifest. I intend to attract into my life whatever it might be. It's an, it's an absolute uh, fail-proof or fail-safe means for me. I absolutely intend to do it. When I put those PBS specials out there to, uh, and decided that I wanted to go out there and make these into something that would help me to fulfill a destiny of using the, the television media as a means for raising the consciousness of this country, I had an intention. And that intention was not something that I ever listened to anybody else. And there's lots of people who consider themselves to be experts in that whole field of public television who have told me so many things about what can't be done and why it can't be done and you can't do all of it. And all of that is just something that I just, let, I just let pass. I just pass when I hear that. And I maintain the intention. And what I have done is I have put together something... Um, about eight or nine different themes, if you will, that I want to just share with you here, very briefly on each one of them, of um, what it takes to create this new rewrite of your uh, intentions in your life. Or a rewriting of the agreement that you have had with reality. And I'd like to suggest that you put no limitations on what it is that you could rewrite as your intention. That is, if you believe that it's possible to fly, then make that a part of your agreement with reality. Not necessarily that you're going to do it. I always tell people who have been thinking about smoking, who've been thinking about quitting drugs, or who've been trying to change something in their life, change around your agreement with what is possible for you. See yourself. Whenever I read stories about some of these great saints who could bilocate, I start practicing by location. <laughs> Where they would talk about someone being a scene in one part of the village and then another part of the village on the same day. And I don't go around bragging about it or telling other people that I'm going to do this or watch this or whatever. I just have this sort of internal, yeah, I think that it's possible to be able to do that. 
I think I watched people do these what they call yogic races, where these yogis would would be, sit down with their legs folded uh, and sitting straight up in a meditative position, and they would bounce themselves down in that position, down a runway, and there would be uh, uh, hurdles about three foot high, 36 inches high. And when they would come to one of those, they were able to lift their entire body over the hurdle and onto. And they would have races doing this. And they have taken the greatest finely tuned uh, Olympic athletes, the gymnasts, the people who have the, the greatest bodies in the world, and they put them in that position with their legs folded, and they say, okay, now see how far you can lift your body uh, doing that. And they can only get about three or four inches off the ground. By inten- and these are people who go, and I've seen, I've seen it happen with my own eyes. I've watched them do it, that they have the ability to move up there, and through consciousness, through their minds, shoop, up they go. And down they, back down they go. And then they go up a little further, bounce, 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 and they come to 136 inches, over they go. It's fast, I love that. <laughs> Pardon? I saw that on a, 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 a video uh, that was done up at, um, at the Chopra Center in Lexington, in Massachusetts, right? Yeah, they had a video of them doing those races right there in Massachusetts. It blew me away to see that. And I began to do the Yoga Sutras. When I heard about the Yoga Sutras, and being able to levitate, and I read Patanjali re- talking about teaching people to do these sutras where you repeat one, and then the second day you repeat the first one, and then the second one, and then the third day you repeat the first one, and the second one, and then you repeat the third one for 15 minutes, and then the fourth day until you get up to about 35 or 40 of these, uh, and you go through all of these sutras, and ultimately when you reach the 40th sutra and you're able to re- repeat each one of these sutras that uh, were... Uh, uh, that preceded it, and they have become, it's a part of your consciousness, just through the repetition uh, uh, process and making it a mantra that uh, these people were able to raise their body up and go down. And I practiced that in my own office, in my own space, and was able to, I literally felt my body move above the ground and seemed to stay there for a few seconds, and then it would ease itself back down just by practicing those sutras. Don't place any limitations on what it is that you would like to be able to attract into your life. Remember that any limitation that you experience in your life, any limitation, is there because of a thought that you have decided is what you can't or can't do. Well, there's eight or nine of these, and I want to go through these, what are called principles for changing your agreement with reality. And I want to just read you this from, again, from Hawkins' brand new book, The Eye of the Eye, E-Y-E of the Eye. And the first one of these is just simply the word attitude. And this is what he says about attitude. The way of spiritual advancement through consciousness is actually uncomplicated and simple. The primary quality is really one of attitude in that one looks at life not as a place to acquire gain, but as an opportunity for learning which abounds even in the smallest of life's details. A spiritual attitude leads one to be friendly, kind, and well-meaning to all life. We find ourselves walking over an ant carefully rather than squashing it, not as a compulsive must or a religious rule, but out of a greater awareness of the value of all life. All animals will be discovered to actually be individuals who respond to respect and attention. Even plants are aware of it when you love and admire them. That's an attitude. That's the attitude I'm speaking about here. And I watched it. I just spent some time with... uh, Franklin Levinson over on Maui in a place called Adventures in Horseback. And if you're ever on Maui, uh, I recommend that you give him a call. Just look up Adventures in Horseback. And he's a horse whisperer himself. And we spent a day with uh, two of my children who, uh, and he was teaching them how to communicate with horses. And he said, what do most people do when they walk up to a horse for the first time? What do they do? We touch him on the nose, don't we? We do this to a horse. He said, if anybody ever came up to you and put their hand on your nose, you would, he said, what you want to do is 
take a different approach. And he began to show us how to communicate with a horse. And this horse, especially with a little girl, who was 11 years old, she, uh, after a very short time, this horse was coming up, walking over to her, nuzzling her, and it, and it was all done through this silent kind of uh, attitude of uh, love and respect for you, rather than uh, I am here. Because horses, as he explained, are uh, basically uh, used as food by mankind for as far back as we can go. And so they have an innate kind of cellular fear of mankind that you have to transcend and you have to overcome. And it's like you open yourself up to that kind of an attitude. So the first word is attitude. Um, the second is something that, um, I, a word that I like, it's called radical humility. Radical humility. That is, it is a, uh, an easing up of the ego so that you can rewrite your agreement with reality that says that who I am is not what I have and what I do and what others think of me and all of my accomplishments and all of my achievements and all of my acquisitions and so on, but that who I am is a piece of God. And as a piece of God, I am radically humble. That is, I have no need to f make myself better than anybody else. I've often said that true nobility is not, is not defined by being better than someone else. It's defined by being better than you used to be. It's just about being better than you used to be. If you've got problems in your life, very often these problems or struggles or difficulties are things that are there because of an absence of humility about who you are and your importance. If you see yourself as a piece of God just as a piece of God. I'll never forget watching uh, Yasai Baba in India, who was asked the question, are you God? And he said, yes, I am. And the questioner was sort of taken aback, and he said, and so are you. He said, the only difference between you and I is that I know it, and you doubt it. That those three magic words that U.S. Anderson wrote about in his wonderful book, Three Magic Words. And at the very end of the book, you don't find out what the three magic words are unless you read the end first until the last paragraph. You are God. You are connected always to God. I am in you, and you are in me, and I am in the Father, and the Father is in you. And when Jesus said it, it is only through me that you will come to know the Father. He was not talking about the Spirit. He said the Spirit, the flesh counts for nothing. It's the Spirit that gives life. He wasn't talking about his body. He wasn't talking about his beard. He wasn't talking about his robe or his sandals or his physicalness. He was speaking about himself, not as a human being here having a spiritual experience, but as a spiritual being having a temporary human experience. And it was through that that you come to know the Father. And so much of our misinterpretation is why over a billion people, a billion people, have been slaughtered in the name of Jesus. Because we interpreted that comment to mean it is only through the body, the flesh, when he never spoke of the flesh. The flesh counts for nothing. Those were his words, not mine. The third is the ability to give love. The ability to give love. If you want to become a person who changes your mind and rewrites your agreement with reality, the ability to give it rather than to seek it. The fourth is an absence of judgment. To see if you can cultivate an attitude in your life in which you understand that when you judge another person, you do not define them. You define yourself as someone who needs to judge. You define yourself. You do not get to define me by calling me a fool, by calling me stupid, by calling me ignorant, by calling me anything. That is just something that you define 
in yourself. That the absence of judgment or the ability to, to suspend the judgment and rewrite your agreement from a non-judgmental way will teach you how to resolve problems almost instantaneously. Most of your problems in relationships come from your willingness, your unwillingness to let go of judgment. The next is giving up guilt. Guilt is nothing more than an attempt to manipulate the past and to make yourself feel less than whole because of anything that you might have done that you feel sorry about. Guilt I've called in your erroneous sounds 30 years ago, I called it uh, a wasted emotion. Because feeling guilty about something can only take place in the present. Now, if you do something that you don't like and you'd like to make amends about it, by all means do so. And if you do something that is wrong or uh, unfortunate or that you, uh, that you feel some shame about whatever, by all means make amends and by all means work at not doing it again. But feeling guilty does nothing more than mean to have you using up the present moment, being immobilized in the present over something that already has taken place. And again, the past is the past. I used to use the example of the Peloponnesian War. If all of us in this room were to sit here and feel guilty about the outcome of the Peloponnesian War and the way the Spartans were treated versus the Athenians or whatever it was, then um, could we change the outcome of the Peloponnesian War with our guilt? And then I would remind people that what happened 20 minutes ago is just as over as the Peloponnesian War. It's just as over. The next is called willingness, and it's probably the most important key. Willingness means I open myself up to the potential or the possibility of being able to create a problem-free life. Willingness is that whole idea of the first principle. I have a mind that's open to everything and attached to nothing. The idea that I will say to myself, these are the conditions in my life that I dislike, and I am willing to create an intention to change them. Willingness. And the next is letting go of resistance. Letting go of any resistance that you might feel. Most of your resistance to creating a world or a life in which you no longer are attracting the same kind of problems you have is rooted in other people's conditioning processes that you have bought into. Whether it's the conditioning process of the, uh, of the groups that you're a part of, or the family that you're a part of, or the cultural experiences that you've been told are the only way that you can uh, behave or look at a problem, letting go of all of that. Just, there's no resistance. I open myself up through meditation to be free from resistance. No resistance. And when you do, as they say in Sanskrit, when the student is ready, when you're really ready, readiness and willingness are the same, when you're ready and willing, whatever teachers you need will be there. They'll show up and they, it works. It's just a, it's a universal principle. The next is called compassion. And compassion on the scale of consciousness is one of the highest uh, forces that you can have. Compassion is the... I had someone say to me the other day who I had dinner with, who I hadn't uh, spoken to in about a year. And this person said to me, you're softer now than you were a year ago. You're softer now. And... I understood what they meant, that there's, there's more compassion in me. If there's anything that has changed over the last 30 years or so in, uh, in my work, it has been a steady sort of movement in that direction of feeling more compassion, not just for other people, but for uh, all of life. I, after the World Trade Center events of the 11th of September 2001, I was asked to appear on uh, television many times because I'd published this book about a spiritual solution to every problem. And I always found 
myself sort of recoiling at listening to some of the military people talking about, well, we killed 300 of these people over here, and we had a great day today for 400 of these people we were able to kill in caves when we were bombing them and so on. And I would say on the TV, and I'd get mail about this, I'd say, but those are 15- and 16-year-old boys. They just happen to live in a different part of the world, and, and maybe they have a little different look to them, and their skin may be a little different shade, but... Uh, they're still young boys, and the, the problem we have in the world is, is one of hatred. And having compassion for those people that we call our enemies is what the greatest teachers who've ever walked among us taught us to be, to have compassion and to create no enemies. Because the final one of these qualities here on, uh, on creating a new agreement, if you will, is called connectedness. Connectedness. A sense that um, every single one of us has uh, some connection through this invisible force that flows through all of us. Compassion and connectedness. Rumi's observation. I, you, me, he, she, they. These are distinctions which do not exist in the garden of the mystics. You can't solve a problem with the same mind that created it. And by changing your attitude and changing your sense of uh, things like compassion and connectedness and all of these nine or ten things that I've just gone through about attitude and shifts remind us that uh, in our thoughts we have created a world which sometimes doesn't seem to work. And we have to change our thoughts. The Native Americans used to say that no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. Comments? I am terribly judgmental. And uh, I pray every morning and ask God to remove that defect of character because that's the only way I see it happening. You got a magic bullet? <laughs> there is a magic bullet for eliminating judgment from your life and it is when you are asking God remind yourself that you are really connected to God you are really asking yourself and that the ability to be non-judgmental is already there it's not something that's going to come to you from outside of you because you and God are one so what you're doing is asking yourself to be what you know you can become. And in doing so, what you do is you start practicing, which is what I do, is start practicing uh, that whole idea of the very first uh, principle, a mind that is open to everything. Here is someone who is different than I am, speaking different than I am. And instead of, at the moment I catch myself sending the judgment, sending love in response to whatever it is, just always sending love. There was an observation that um, I wanted to read on here, and it's from uh, William Butler Yeats, who was one of my real heroes in my life, Irish poet. He said, Florence Farr once said to me, if we could say to ourselves with sincerity, the passing moment is as good as any I shall ever know, we could die upon the instant and be united with God. So in this instant, when I'm about to judge, I stop myself in that instant. Yes? My question is about uh, letting go of resistance. That's where my work is right now. I'm really conscious and aware of my resistance, which I know is the way to releasing it. But i just love to hear you talk some more about it. I think I will in the next principle, but the idea of resistance, um, the way that I find myself uh, moving past resistance always is by is through meditation. It's always through silence. If I can't figure it out, it's like no matter what it is, if I feel the resistance coming, it's... As I do this two or three times, I start feeling myself getting lighter 
and resistance just passes. I, it's almost like it's a way of leaving your body, because resistance is all in the physical world. Resistance is the source of problems. And when you let go, you're letting God. And bringing God in through japa is a really fast and, and beautiful way. And even if I feel short of breath or I feel a, a pain or whatever it might be, any kind of physical thing, it's the process of letting go japa. When I've, I've said on the PBS special, you may have heard me, whenever I call Deepak and ask him about any problem I ever have, his response is, meditate. <laughs> meditate. I'll say, but Deepak, I've got other things. Meditate. Because it's always making conscious contact. Yes. Talking about rewriting our agreement, I thought of a uh, son of thing that Tennyson has said that I'd forgotten about that uh, is real close and dear to my heart. And I wrote it down to make sure I got it right. Uh, some people see things as they are and say, why? I dream of things that never were and say, why not? Great observation. I, how many of you remember the moment of uh, Edward Kennedy uh, quoting that at, uh, at his brother's death, at his brother's funeral, speaking about uh, you know, the ability to think and look at why not? Okay, this is the seventh principle. And one of my very favorite ones to speak about. I learned about this, made this one of the guiding principles, my top ten secrets, if you will, for success and inner peace. When I was a leader of a group of people who um, were in uh, alcohol rehabilitation and drug addiction re rehab, and I walked into the a room to be a part of this group and there was a sign on the wall and I noted it and I had never really thought of it before and it became this seventh principle it says there are no justified resentments and I thought how frequently in my own lifetime I have justified my own resentments about the way I have been treated about things that have happened to me, about um, the way uh, I have viewed other people's behavior and putting the attention on myself and so on. And I got to talking about, in this group, what the, we were told when we were going through the training to, to lead these groups, which was many years ago in my doctoral studies, my doctoral dissertation was about group counseling and group therapy. We were told that um, no matter what happens in this group, no matter what somebody says, no matter how offensive it may sound to you, no matter how angry it may make you that they are saying what they are saying, there are no justified resentments. And the reason that you cannot justify any of your resentments is because... Your resentments are serving to hurt you rather than to help you. And those resentments that you carry around, even though you think you have every right in the world to feel that way. I've heard people say it many times. I have a right to be miserable. 
married to the person that I'm married to. If you were married to this person, you would feel that you had a right to be miserable as well. And people go around defending their rights to be miserable or defending their rights to be uh, unhappy or even defending their rights to be, uh, to be depressed. Depression is a big thing these days and people believe that they have a right to their depression. After all, what I've been through and all that I have experienced, and they're willing to share that right away. And of course, and since I uh, wrote about that and put it down as one of my uh, most important principles, guiding principles, principles of my life, I started thinking about my own resentments as well, and I had many that I was still justifying. And I'd like you to really take a look at this, and I present it from a little different perspective than um, any of the other um, of these ten principles. See, I think of uh, this game show that's on television called uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And most of you have seen it. It's on all over the world. And in this game show, there are two levels that you want to reach. The first level is called the thousand dollar level. And this thousand dollar level is basically a giveaway level. It's a very simple level to get to. If you get to this thousand dollar level, what you have is you have to answer three or four or five questions, I believe it is, and they're quite simple questions. And then you get to go away with something. So in listening to this program and attending this uh, seminar here, uh, if you go away, if you want to go away with at least something, I suggest that you get to this level before you leave here. And this thousand dollar level is the level that is called ridding yourself of all blame. Now this means, and this is different for many people, it means taking total responsibility for everything that is going on in your life. Everything. So the condition of your marriage, the state of your health, whatever weight you have or don't have or wouldn't like to have, whatever illnesses are a part of your life, everything. You say, and you do it without guilt. So that if you have cancer... You don't say, I deserved cancer for something that I did. Because God isn't about distributing cancer to some people and not to others on the basis of whether they behave or follow a certain set of rules. What you say to yourself is, I have it. It's mine. I own it. And I only have a capacity to do something about it if I take responsibility for it. So you do it without guilt, without any assignment of uh, your, you have been a bad person because of whatever is going on physically. And this is going on whether you have arthritis or bursitis or whether you have heart disease or whatever. I'm standing in front of you and talking to you and uh, I've talked over the years about how I don't even get colds. And yet, I had a heart attack. And I don't do heart attacks. I never thought it was possible for me to do heart attacks. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I meditate. I have a relatively stress-free life. I watch my diet. I keep my cholesterol low. I'm not overweight. Uh, I do all of the things that you're supposed to do. I don't even drink soda pop. I drink water all the time. I, keep, I do everything that all the manuals tell me to do. And how could this possibly happen to me? I just don't understand this, you see. And now you know something, that little voice that I just gave really is sort of representative of what I experienced when that elephant came into that room in Tallahassee, Florida and sat on my chest that night in the middle of the night. I was in a total state of denial that this is something that could possibly happen to me. But everything that has ever happened to me in my life or everything that I have created in my life, has always been a part of my teaching. 
It's been a part of uh, my material, if you will, part of what I go out there and write about. And as soon as I had this heart attack and went through the experience uh, and came out of it, I rewrote the forward to a spiritual solution to every problem just to let people know that this is something that I had to deal with as well, that I, I'm not above any of this. And I had to learn two very important things firsthand after that heart attack. One was the, the essence and the importance of uncertainty as a part of the spiritual path. That in the physical world, there is no such thing as certainty. And uncertainty, the, the minute that you think you've got everything handled, the minute you think you've got everything straightened out. I mean, I talked to a man, Jeff, yesterday, who was married to, very happily married to a woman who was a physician, pediatrician, bright lady, and she had a fall, just out of nowhere, fell with her mom, was it, Jeff? And um, she was okay afterwards, she seemed to be okay, didn't go to the hospital, that night she died. Gone. In one moment. And he's here, and uh, working on it, and uh, a beautiful man. It was great talking with you yesterday. But I haven't been able to get that out of my mind uh, because I was doing the same thing in that hospital when I was lying there and I was having different doctors come in and it was very interesting. The doctors that would come in that were pessimistic who told me, well, you know, this could be a quintuple bypass. I said, what the hell? Quintuple? <laughs> what are five things, you know? <laughs> and uh, we're gonna, we could take veins out of your ears and your butt and your uh, legs and... Uh, and put them in there. We might have to go and get cow's ve uh, ve veins or something. I mean, this, and they would, and I couldn't wait for them to get out of the room because they were just telling me all of the things that could possibly go wrong. And then the other doctor, my cardiologist, uh, Doctor Bartsokas, would come in and he said, "I've seen you running. I know how. I know your life. I've read your book." He said, uh, "You've probably got one blockage and one artery. It's probably some genetic thing. We'll pop it out. We'll stick in a stent there." And he said, "You'll be out of there the next day." And he would walk out of the room. I'd say, um, excuse me, why don't you come back? I'd like you to spend a little more time here with me. <laughs> and it was energy. It was always energy. And the ones that would come in with the negativity, I wanted to sort of dismiss. But the ones who came in with... So I learned to deal with uncertainty. And I watched people. The man that was next to me uh, in the room there in the cardiac ward um, didn't make it through the night. And I watched him come. That was the other thing I had to deal with, not just on an intellectual level, what you've had to deal with, Jeff, on a physical level, is that uh, our own mortality. Maslow said that self-actualizing people get over death almost as if it didn't happen, because for them it doesn't. Because none of us are born and none of us are... That's, those are all illusions. That that's just because we identify ourselves with our bodies. And when you begin to see yourself as a spiritual being, and you truly begin to see it, and you can't see it until you have that, that experience. And when you have that experience, your own mortality is something you become the observer of. And as you said to me yesterday, Jeff, I'm just grateful for the time that I had together with her. And that's the way you look at it, knowing that uh, in a world of eternity, death is impossible. So I had those two very important and powerful lessons to learn. Uncertainty, mortality, and the physical sense. And I take total responsibility for it. And what turns out is that I did have a blockage in one artery. Not a real serious one. They call it the widow maker. <laughs> As he explained it to me, I said, oh, that's a real nice name for it. The LAD, if you know what the LAD is, the lower anterior descending, and there was a little kink in it, and cholesterol had accumulated in there, and I had this blockage. And he also told me that I wouldn't have survived it had I not been an athlete and running and keeping myself in shape over the past 30 years or so. He said, you have the heart of a very strong young man. You just have a blockage in the widow maker. And they put a stent in there, and the next day I walked five miles. The next day. And I was running two weeks later, and uh, 
been having stress tests a lot more these days. <laughs> and checking on things like cholesterol and so on. But it raised my consciousness level and also taught me to be a bit more compassionate than perhaps I had been in the past with people who suffer from these kinds of struggles in their lives. But it was important for me to take responsibility for it. You see, if you don't take responsibility for what is going on in your life, in your body, in your relationships, everywhere, if you don't take responsibility for it, you are placing responsibility on something or someone outside of yourself. And in order for you to be able to do something about it, you have to wait for something or someone or some event outside of yourself to change in order for you to get better. And the likelihood of that happening is very small. But if it's on you, and it is yours, and you own it, then at least you have the potential or the capacity or the ability to be able to create the willingness to say, I think I'm going to work at doing something about this. I'm going to haul in a miracle. I'm going to call in one. Or I'm going off to the wilderness, as that woman I told you about earlier did. I'm going off to the wilderness, and I'm going to make contact with God, and I'm going to get quiet and peaceful for the first time in my life. I'm going to use the nature, the wilderness, as therapy. I'm going to, I'm going to trust my instincts. I'm going to turn it over to God. I can do anything. But if it's somebody else's fault, or the fact that we live in a carcinogenic world, or the fact that something out there happened when I was a little boy or a little girl, I can't change the facts. I can't change the facts. But I can change how I deal with them. So blame has to go. Now, in order to rid yourself of blame, you have to practice something called forgiveness. You can't get past the $1,000 level where you can leave this program with at least something unless you're willing to forgive. And A Course in Miracles has one of the most profound lines um, I've ever come across. It says, in order to forgive, you must have blamed. If you never blamed, you don't have anything to forgive. You don't have anyone to forgive. So getting rid of blame and forgiveness are synonymous terms. They're the same thing. And forgiveness, as Mark Twain said, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. Forgiveness is the lesson of visionary consciousness. It's the image of, of Jesus on a cross and being further tortured, and out of him comes, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And what is meant by that in my heart is they don't understand that when they throw a spear into me, they're throwing a spear into all of humanity. Because Jesus was not one who spoke of the flesh. He spoke of the oneness, the connectedness of all of us, excluded no one. And always remember that as you practice being Christ-like. There is no one to exclude. No one. Not in the kingdom of heaven. So forgiveness means taking a look at your past, recapitulating, as I spoke about earlier, if you will, and deciding that you have no enemies. Just the absence of the possibility of any enemies being in your life. And everyone, and you might want to make a list of, or you might want to go through all of the people who have harmed you in any way. The, the parents who behaved in the ways that they did, the children who don't respect you, the, the spouse who walked out on you, the person who borrowed money from you and has never paid it back, the person who sued you and you had put you through all of those kinds, all of that, whatever you do. And I've told the story before of a time in my life when I had a lawsuit imposed upon me for the only time in my life by a woman who had spent 15 years in a mental institution. 
and who decided that what I had written about and spoken about on the radio was the cause of her mental illness. And she got an attorney to take that case. And um, it was thrown out in a, what they call a summary judgment, and they appealed the summary judgment. So they continued to keep it, keep this wound festering. And I spent a couple of years being concerned about my reputation. It was before I really stopped caring about things like that. This goes back 20 or so years. Now, if somebody wants to say that I was the cause of the mental illness, I'll say, well, I'm listening to that. You know, that's an interesting point of view. I never thought of that before. Maybe I did. Um, and also, when you turn 60, you stop caring what other people think anyway, I think. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I carried that around, and I hired an attorney, and I spent a lot of money, and I was angry at this particular person for doing all of this and so on. And then I remember... Uh, in a meditation, just saying, I'm through with all of this. I called my attorney. I said, I'm not paying any more money for this. I'm not giving it any more energy whatsoever. None. I refuse to participate in it. I'll just uh, ignore it. And uh, they can make all the threats they want. They can say anything they want. It's, a, it's an absurdity, and I won't play the game anymore. And I then started in my meditations to surround this particular person with love just as much light and love as I could possibly get to this person. And I did it in the morning, I did it in the afternoon, I did it in the evening, and I tried to imagine with some compassion that I didn't have before what it must be like to live in a mental institution for 15 years and how terrible and awful that was being. Instead of being thinking about me and what was, this, what was happening to me, I began to put love toward this person. And I had flowers sent to her. And I sent some books. And on the third day after I started practicing this, the lawsuit was dropped. So it was, uh, it was again, one of those lessons. Everything I think that I go through in my life is, is always a lesson. And almost every struggle that I've ever gone through has taught me to be a little less blaming, a little more forgiving, a little more compassionate, a little kinder, always. It seems to work that way. So now when those crappy things start showing up in my life, I just stop telling myself that this shouldn't be happening, and I go into that place where I say, what, what's the lesson here? What do I have to learn? And I can help it to go away and attract into my life something different. Forgiveness is the essence of higher consciousness and spirituality. If you want to understand, there are no justified resentments. That's the thousand-dollar level. No blame, total responsibility, no guilt, no I deserve this, just no blame. I'll take it all on. It's all mine. I own every bit of it. And remember, everything that you consider to be a problem in your life is really just an illusion. If I could just take you in this moment and put you into a coma for a day or so, in that day when you couldn't think, all of your problems would disappear. If you open up the Torah, open up the Old Testament, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. 31 lines later, it says, and all that God created was good. That presents an enormous conundrum for those of us who believe in problems. If God created everything, and everything that God created was good, then problems, evil, disease, disorder, disharmony, all of these things represent our moving away from God and taking on this ego consciousness. And all we have to do is begin to move back towards God, which is what every one of these principles in some way or another has something to do with. Stopping this absurd notion that you are separate from God, you are what you have and what you do, and what others think of you, and all of this, and rerouting yourself so that you're moving back towards God rather than away from God. So that's the $1,000 level. Now you answer five more questions. And metaphorically, these are more difficult questions. But if you do that, you get to the $32,000 level. And the $32,000 level is the level that gives you two things. First of all, you get to leave this program, you get to leave here, with something very substantial, $32,000. 
metaphorically, I'm speaking about leaving here with something of very substantive uh, amount, $32,000. Metaphorically, it means you get something really worthwhile. All right. But you've got to go through these five questions. And when you get to this level of $32,000, not only do you get to leave with something uh, very, uh, very substantial, but you also open up the vista, you open up the windows, if you will, to look out onto the potential for enormous, enormous wealth, not just uh, substantial wealth. You get to look at million-dollar level. You're just looking at it. It isn't a guarantee, but if you don't get past this level, you don't ever even get to look at it. And this is the $32,000 level in this principle that there are no justified resentments. In response to everything, you must be able to give away love. The ability to give love, no matter what comes your way, is the $32,000 level. It's that notion that Patanjali spoke about. When you find it in your heart, when you become steadfast in your abstention of thoughts of harm directed toward others, all living creatures will cease to feel enmity in your presence. This is spiritual consciousness. This is the place where resentments become impossible so that you get the opportunity to practice this on a regular basis with virtually anyone that comes into your life. No matter what they say, and the worst that they say gives you an opportunity to practice it. The more hostile they are, the greater your opportunity to practice this. Because anybody, anybody can send love in response to a person who smells good or a person who looks good or a very nice person. Anybody can send love there. It's easy to raise a child who always behaves and always says, yes, mom, and yes, daddy, yes, I love you, and does everything that they're supposed to. I've never seen any of those children. No, I have. That's not true. I have some of my children were much easier to raise and to love than others. All of my children were easy to love, but some of them it was more difficult to express it than others. And when a person behaves in a way towards you that you find offensive or that you find difficult or who violates a principle that you believe in or who refuses to uh, acknowledge uh, you or to be nice and so on and your response is to lower the energy field by being the way they are you are not at the $32,000 level. It's the thing that St. Francis taught us with his life. It's what, it's what uh, Gandhi taught us with his life. When Gandhi was assassinated in 1948, out of him came the words Ram, 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 and he died. God, 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 because that's all he had inside. His, his life was his message. And when we create that kind of, a, of an awareness within ourselves, in response to the things that are most difficult. And I must say that this seems to be easier for women to do and mothers to do than men. <laughs> because the wars are not fought by women on our planet, by and large. Uh, there's a feminine energy, a fem feminine consciousness that I've watched, I've watched mothers. I've watched my wife. I've watched my own mother. I've watched other mothers. I've been a, a counselor and a therapist to many mothers. I've watched them when their children are abusive and say nasty things and, and, and a man will often interpret their sending love in response to that as a weakness. But somehow instinctively they know that this is the way that I'm supposed to be. It's, it's instinct, it's cellular. 
They can't help themselves. These are their children or other people's children. These are the people that I love. And, and you'll see them tolerate it. And, and, the, and the man, including myself, for a good part of my life, it's like, you know, they just need a good kick in the ass. <laughs> or they really need to be slapped around a little. Or they need to be, to- you know, and it's like, and you respond with anger to that. But there's an instinctive notion of being able to send love. That's what St. Francis taught us with his life. That's why I, that's why I dedicated uh, Spiritual Solution to him. That's why I wrote half the book based upon that famous prayer attributed to St. Francis. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. If we want to truly call ourselves spiritual beings, if we truly want to believe in the messages of the most influential who have ever walked among us, the Mohammeds, the Buddhas, the Jesus, the Lao Tzu's, these people came here and taught us a message. And that message is in response to everything, be steadfast in your abstention of thoughts of harm. And you can change people around you by bringing that energy instead of joining them in the lower energy that they have. You can change that. It's astonishing. I've watched myself practice this. A, a, a mother, not too long ago, was yelling at a child, two-year-old child, in a grocery store, screaming and hollering. And I just moved in a little closer and attempted to just, instead of giving a lecture and saying, excuse me, but, you know, I've written a book about a spiritual solution. To every, I'd like to have a talk with you right here. Uh, instead of that approach, what I did was I just moved into there and tried to radiate out a different energy. Just sending out a higher and a faster energy. And as I did that, I noticed that the mother not only stopped, but the child began to, to feel a little bit more comfortable as well. That you can, when you, when you practice it, and I know what you're thinking, and I know, I can hear the resistance to this, how difficult it is. They say the, the most difficult thing, there's this, the most difficult thing in the world to do is to send love in response to hate. The second is to defend the absent. Defend the absent. Whoever is there being talked about, somebody has to take their position. You be that person. And the third is to admit that you were wrong. Not in that you made a mistake, but that you have been making the wrong kinds of choices in your life and that led to this right now. But the most difficult, according to Anthony DeMello, is to send love in response to hate. And when you can become steadfast in your abstention of thoughts of harm directed toward others, Everything and everyone around you will be impacted. But more than anything else, what it does is it gives you the opportunity to have the awareness that every resentment you have is a lower energy. You want to stop justifying it and instead get rid of the blame at the $1,000 level and at the $32,000 level. Send love to it. Send kindness to it. Send peace to it. Even if it just takes a moment of contemplative prayer. 